Now, so 1648 Westphalia comes through and brings the idea called religious tolerance. Everyone is free to believe what they believe. You cannot kill and fight a man for what they believe. That sanity of freedom also begets a certain thing. There's always a warning when Paul tells us, let's not use our liberty for vice. Because history has proven every time liberty comes through men, the unstable abuse it. Okay? And sometimes we ask ourselves, should we have a sort of tightening of things for the unstable uh, to keep in order and in line? But then again, we remember, God has not called us to manage human souls. It's his business, it's his responsibility. The excesses will always be there, but our responsibility is to do what God has called us to do and consequently believe God to change what must be changed, to deal with whoever he has to deal with. And sometimes, many times when madness comes through, right? Some of you who read his literature, there's a fellow who said when the madness of an entire nation disturbs a solitary mind, what happens? It's not enough to say the man is mad. There's a madness that comes to certain individual when the nation is mad. They start to also look like they are mad. But sometimes it's not them. Sometimes the, the general mass, the total, the bigger number of people can become so inclined. For example, if you are one individual who was living in Rome in that time, when there were indulgences, the venerations of Mary, the sacraments, and all these kinds of things, and then for you, you disagree, you'd look like the mad one. Right? But sometimes the majority are the mad ones, you know, sadly. Uh, and then sometimes, of course, we try to use human means to regulate, and that's what some governments are trying to do. But you will never regulate faith. You cannot regulate faith. You cannot put God in a box. You cannot put a God in a box in a glorious church. Hallelujah. Now, when that period happens and there is religious tolerance, People are free to think, right? because there is freedom to think. You will not attack me for what I believe. You see, then it was either this or that. Now there is freedom. Everyone has their faith, but we are not attacking each other. The societies and communities have tolerance. I have my opinion, you have yours. And interesting as it is, from 1648 into 1789, we have what they call the enlightened meant period or the age of reason that is when the idea of reason starts to come and crop through it's the first time we start to hear it strongly that's 1648 into the 1700s 89 it's a very very interesting uh, period of time um what is the enlightenment period what is the age of reason it begins when the block is drawn between secularism and the sacred life. And because of that, this is a time when the word secular and the understanding of secular is going to become more clearly apparent in a generation to separate it from what is called sacred. It is a time when men are starting to reason. Yes, you believe in this, but is it reasonable? Yes, you believe in the Trinity, but is it reasonable? Yes, you believe in the separation of water, but is it reasonable? Can you appeal to me and reason and explain that? And so, because, we, because of that period, uh, faith starts to serve reason and not the other way around. In the earlier time, reason was serving faith. In this dispensation, faith is serving reason. You understand what I'm saying? Faith is serving reason. That means it is subject to reason. We can only believe what is reasonable. If something cannot fit in human reason, then it's not for us. It doesn't work for us. And then consequently, ideas start coining through how man is good and is not bad. They say that darkness in man is because of ignorance. And ignorance can be dealt with through enlightenment. Educate the man. They'll become better citizens. Give them an education about life, good manners, good morals. 
deal with their ethics, you'll have good people. So they thought. And then that's when the idea of humanism is birthed. Who knows what humanism is? Humanism is the idea that man is the center of his reality and truth, not God. What I think to be real is real. What I think to be true is true. It doesn't matter whether you agree with me or you don't. It doesn't matter you, whether you, you feel it or you don't feel it. If I think something is true, it's true. If I think it's real to me, it's real. Right? So man becomes the center, not the standard of the Bible. So yes, you could have revelations on your Bible. You talk all you want. But if it's not a reality to me, it's not true. If it is not truth to me, it is not true. And then in that same period, that's the same period we see uh, the birth of modern science and discovery. When you go to read through, you read of men like Galileo, they gain prominence in this period. Newton, they gain prominence in this period. Copernicus, they gain prominence in this period. John, Johann Kepler, they gain prominence in this period. And the idea now shifts to what is discovered, what is scientific, and if it is scientific and discovered, then maybe we prefer that to what is written. The Bible starts to lose relevance because some scientific discoveries and empirical evidences are against what is written in Scripture. You are saying Daniel was uh, swallowed by a big fish. Which fish? Is it possible for a man to stay in a fish for three days? Can he have enough oxygen or the bigger part is hydrogen? Can hydrogen sustain a human lungs for four days? Can he, how was he living? You understand? If fish is full of water and it breathes through, uh, yes, through gills, what was John, John uh, um, whatevering through? Those are just fictitious historical realities. They are not truth. How can they be truth? In a big fish, where exactly was he? Because science has cut a fish and looked through a big fish, even a whale, and it can't see where a man like Jonah would be placed. Come on, reason. And then that's the time when modern philosophy is born. Some of the most poisonous boys of that day. There's a guy called René Descartes. All right? Very poisonous fellow. He was a very popular philosopher. And then he puts down his um, Bible in 1650s. And then he says, I think, therefore I am. I am what I think. All these other things you're teaching us are useless. Praise God. And then now there's a bigger problem because Christianity is trying to be relevant in a time when men are reasoning, science is coming, they're being hit by discoveries and philosophies on every side. Now there's a problem with a Christian. And we'll come to that. There was a fellow in history called Voltaire. He was the biggest poison in the Enlightenment history. That fellow which was a French philosopher, lived between, within the 1700s. This fellow built a group of guys, uh, sort of a, a fellowship of guys. They used to call themselves the lovers of wisdom. And Voltaire was not only opposed to the Christian faith, he hated Christian faith, and he exalted philosophical thought way beyond the Christian Bible. Not only did he exalt it, he was aggressive. He spoke some of the most dangerous words a man could speak in the late 1700s. One of the statements quoted, he says, the Bible is what fools have written, what imbeciles commend, what rogues teach, and young children are made to learn by heart. So he means to say, if, you, if it is written, whoever wrote it is a fool. Whoever commends it, like me, is an imbecile. And whoever teaches it is a rogue. And this is something they teach young children. It's through the age of enlightenment that you start to hear certain statements which have reverberated even into the 21st century, such as the Bible is opium. Christianity is opium for the poor. Now, as if you're poor, you need opium. You need something to keep you stable and keep you sustained such that you stay on a height, you understand, with general happiness. 
It's these guys who start that. He attacked the Christian faith. He published in history, Voltaire published more than 20,000 writings against religion. Against what? Religion. And you want to know why? Because you see, go back to where we're coming from and tell me whether you will not understand where these men are coming from. They have read history in the Roman Catholicism where priests are manipulating people through indulgences and acts of penance and it's Christ plus, Christ plus and we see wars of popes who are hiring uh, crusaders to go evading lands to kill the enemies of the cross and loot gold and silver. We see um, these crusaders going in the name of Jesus and they are raping women and burning to stake people there. We see divisions and political influences. We see simony we see what we see nepotism we see favoritism we see corruption in rome we see wealth amassed and we see buildings built in the name of religion but they look like persian zoroaster shrines and gold and silver is everywhere the spiritual people are the most influential they are attached to politics and everybody there is it looks rotten nobody cares who is and who isn't they are killing they're paying behind others to kill each other they're manipulating systems to get their way they're doing everything crazy you hearing deaths and 35 percent of europe was killed only between the lutherans and the roman catholics in just the space of 30 years and all of this is what is based on religion 10 percent is killed 20 about 11 11.5 or 12 percent is killed every year that is 35 percent is killed in 30 years and they're all killed in the name of religion and there's somebody thinking these guys are fools why would they write something that would kill people how they write something that will divide people? What examples have they set as leaders? You remember the time of Cromwell, when he, as a Puritan with 20,000 members, 20,000 folk, fight, right, the king, and then oust him and burn him to stake, and then in England you have a Cromwell government. What happened with that? It was split, it was broken, it could not live any other day. The Christians cannot even lead a nation, they said. They have to now go to Scotland and get James and Mary, get James, uh, James, uh, I think James or William. Uh, they have to get kings back for the monarchy. The monarchy is more direct than Christians are. And indeed, even in this dispensation, there are things you see in the Christian faith and sometimes regret to be Christian. You look on television and see what we call pastors. You will weep. And sometimes I don't blame the people out there who have been enlightened through education because at least education gives you basic understanding, common decency, to live with a common man and understand the simplest principle of natural justice. Look at the guys who have become more, more rabid in our dispensation, who are men of God. Sadly, many of them did not have a decent education. There's something education does. It teaches the Acholi to sit with the Langi. It teaches the Itaso to sit with the Japadola. It teaches the Ugandan to connect to the Nigerian. Education is key. <laughs> Seriously, it is key. That is why our earlier fathers, when you read of the Wesleyans and who later in the awakenings, you will see they invested much time in education. The education is key because it opens the human mind to think a certain way. It opens the human mind to think a certain way. Not everybody that you see out there huh, is of right thinking mind. Some people in society are honestly crazy, but they are just not at the level of snapping to kill a human being. You understand? I have seen, you have seen, I was watching television that day, and I saw a preacher who was standing and he was boasting of how many women he has slept with. And yes, I saw it with my own eyes. It wasn't a rumor. You understand? He's boasting of how they've reported him to court of women who have his children. He's just saying, I am still a man of God, I am still serving. You hear a preacher hurling abuse, speaking profanity with a mouth that even a non-believer could not say why won't they call us mad why won't they call us imbeciles and fools 
they have the right to say so. How do you know how much division is in the Pentecostal movement? A thousand denominations now by 29, 20, 2019. We have a thousand denominations in the Pentecostal movement. We are more divided than anything. We cannot lead a government. Church history has proved that. We cannot run anything. We have systems that can run it through biblical principle, yes, but when we are put in power, we can't run it. The secular people run our principles better. Who knows how many Pentecostal churches are in Denmark? Not more than 57. Go to Kinshasa. 7,000 churches in Kinshasa. Look at the crime rates. Look at the death rates. Look at poverty rates. Look at prostitution. Look at gambling. Look at alcoholism. It is in 7,000. It, it's in the area of 7,000 churches. And then you go to a nation with 70, 57 churches, and it, which are even small of 2,200 people, and it's still working. That only tells you that these nations are not standing by your definition of the Pentecostalism. And later, when I get into the Pentecostal movement, you're going to see a madness, a certain madness. That now it's the toys and not the tools. It's how many jets I have, not how many souls I want. You understand what I'm saying? It's which come driving and how I'm ushered in. It's not how Christ is presented to men. It's, it's so crazy. It's ugly. It's, it's, it's dissuading and stumbling to the men that watch us. What kind of gospel do I have when I cannot wash your feet? Do you understand what I'm saying? What kind of gospel can I preach to a man like that when the leader of the Catholic Church, 1.2 billion people, he goes on his feet to kneel and, and kiss the feet of a president? What are we doing? For us, we're being carried, we're exalted. And people don't see that that is wrong. What did Jesus tell us to do? He says, if any of you requires to be the greatest, let him be the least. You think these are not scriptures? They are scriptures. But we're starting to look stupid. The wars within the Christian faith, we're starting to look stupid. The misunderstandings between believers, we are starting to look imbecile, like Voltaire is saying it. Why? Because when you look at these enlightened ones, they have a more stable moral life. And later when I get into the end of it, you will start to see the things that are, are killing. Later into the Pentecostal movement, you will see what I'm trying to talk about. Pentecostals can't even keep the simplest relationship given to man, marriage. We can't even keep our wives. And we are not responsible for that. A certain system that went beyond us is doing that to us. We are simply recipients. That's why I don't judge any man. No. Who brought it to him? Who taught him to him that way? We are victims. We are victims. You understand? Families are dysfunctional. You cannot trust the Pentecostal to do business with. This tongue speaking, many of them, if you give him your business, it's gone. If you hire him, you're going to fall out. If you lend him money, you're going to be separated forever. Your friendship is gone. If you refer him somewhere to work that seat, your reputation is going to be ruined. You understand what I'm saying? And this is the reason why we were not dealt with well. Then you see the people who are a bit held back and liberal, they are keeping everything. Their finances are straight, their children are straight, their, everything is straight. Then we're saying, is it only about screaming and falling down? It's more than that. The truth makes us free. So that means we throw out truth the more. Praise God. Voltaire said that in a hundred years after his death, he said Christianity will be no more and the Bible will not be read anywhere. Praise God. That's what Voltaire said. Newsflash. A hundred years later, the house in which he wrote and spoke these words became the Geneva Bible Society. <laughs> the place that centrally was used to spread and, and distribute Bibles across the world. You cannot bring Christianity and the faith in extinction. That is a lie. But it's through 
these enlightened movements, then we have the birth of what you and I are calling democracy, the government of the people for the people by the people. God is not a democrat. Read history. Read your Bible. God is not a democrat. We ask him who he says so, we go with what he says. Praise God. And sometimes man can go against God's choice. He says, you've rejected my leaders. Israel rejected God's opinion, and they voted for Saul. But God says, that was not my man. My man was David. I prophesied it before that a man with my heart shall come. So did I mean that God didn't want to bring kingship, but he wanted to bring it a certain way. Israel wanted it a certain way. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm not against you voting, but I'm only trying to make you understand where it comes through. What is that to do to the Christians? The Christians start now to faction doctrines to provide for the enlightenment period and what we see is they are conformed and compromised because some of their methods are looking stupid right but you see the gospel is foolishness to him that is perishing but the christians were not strong enough to say you see i know this is foolish but it is truth what they did is they inclined and compromised just to provide for the enlightenment and the age of reason which was uh, outshining them and later you will see another kind of thing coming in history like liberalism it's so much like the enlightenment um, but again we see the same similar challenge right we see the same similar challenge church starts to compromise there's a need for reformation again <laughs> and I told you once pressures hit the church and reason faith is now subject to reason there is a need for either reformation or revolution and in the 1700s a certain idea is coined it's called pietism this thing originated uh, from germany and it stresses two things it says look the challenge we are having of why the age of reason is superseding and going beyond and overriding our faith is simple we no longer read the bible and we no longer have men with personal experience and that was true because in the age of reason days of the 1700s coming to the 1800s you start to see many people in church but there were few conversions you see a roman catholic going to church every day but he's not converted you see a protestant going to church every day but he's not born again because they apply reason. That was the time we started to see men in church who were not converted. Religion existed, but conversions were not. So these guys in Germany, Philip Jacob Spinner, August Hermann, and Blaise Pascal, these guys think the challenge is we are not giving experiences and the study of the word. We are not reconciling the revelation of truth and the experiences that come with that. Some are either reading the word too much and teaching it, but without the experience of the person of the spirit, or some carry the person of the spirit, but without the reading of the word. That makes them unstable. That's why I tell people, if you have to forget everything, remember this one thing. The word and the spirit is the secret to the move of the church. Even when I was starting my own ministry, the Lord told me, if you can reconcile the word and the spirit well, it's amazing how fast your ministry will grow. Because that is the secret. I saw it many years ago and I realized that many ministries were either so spiritual and less word, or some were so word but less spiritual. You have to be so balanced in that reality. You have to be a person who is deep. You can articulate the deepest things in scripture. But when they bring a lame man a deaf ear, when they bring a demon, you better be able to deal with it. If the word and the spirit agree, believe me, that is the basis concept of what they call piety. He says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And this year one, they agree. Praise God. We don't want you to come out of courage and turn in the doctrine of faith, justification through faith, the unlimited atonement of Christ, and then you go with all your head. You understand what I'm saying? No, that's the truth. 
Because you can come up with all this stuff and by the time you're done, you can't even rebuke a devil. Yet they taught you how to heal in the same Bible school. They taught you how to cast a devil in the same Bible school. They taught you how to do missions in the same Bible school. But many times now, people come out of Bible school and they start to look like cheap copies of great originals. They start to appear as echoes instead of being voices. That is not going to happen in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. So that is how we have the place of a need for pietism. These guys that I've mentioned are saying this one thing, the word and personal experience. That is Philip Jacob Spinner, August Herman, Blaise Pascal. And that is the time in the 1700s into 1760 and all that 17th century, we start to see what you and I have heard of called the Moravian Revival, called Ludwig Zizendorf. Nicholas Ludwig Zizendorf of Moravian. That's when the Moravian revival comes through. Um, there was a certain uh, persecuted brethren, if I can take you back in the earlier hundreds, of the Bohemians in Czechoslovakia. You remember the Bohemians of Czechoslovakia who were killed and persecuted? Uh, after who? John Hus. When those guys went seeking for help, they got to a fellow in Moravia called who? Zizendorf. And then they start meetings within, and it's what brings us what we call the Moravian Revival. And those are the people who embrace the Lutheran doctrine. Moravians started preaching and teaching present truth, the gospel, salvation, and the experience of the power and the anointing that comes with that. And I'm going to come with a bit later to show you a huge, huge debate that ensues in this because later on we start to see debates of the power. Is it power? Is it emotion? Is it, you know, those things still exist amid some people. Fall, don't fall. Cry, don't cry. I'm going to bring sanity to that because some people, uh, they, they, they are throwing away the baby uh, and, and the water, even the soap <laughs> and the sponge. Praise God. So it's through that that he shelters these people and then the beginning of the Moravian revival. And then these people begin modern work of missionary. And then um, it's through that that we start to see sanity coming back. They are stressing the challenge of why the intellectual fellows, the enlightened ones, and age of reason is taking over. We have Christians who don't read the word and don't have the experience. So the Christian of the word and the experience come together. And then they are stressing three major things. One, personal conversion experiences. Everyone must have an experience of God. You shouldn't be uh, surviving under another man's embers. A man should not burn incense in the Holy of Holies and you smell it in the outer court and think that you're in the same place with the same man because you're equal before God, yet you're unequal in the yoking because the man is on another altar he's seated in another place and he sees god from another angle and it's one thing for you to enjoy the merry go by of the anointing when the presence comes and you're all filled but you know the difference between the man emitting the incense and you who is smelling it you learn to burn your own incense praise god and then they emphasize the place of intimate fellowship within the body of christ can we sit down and start having deliberate fellowships with each other? Can I sit with two, three, four down brothers and then we start sharing the word? That's why I tell Christians, if your friends are telling you about movies and Game of Thrones last season, those are not the people you need. <laughs> Believe me. Your best friend should be somebody you should sit out of tea and not discuss who is pregnant, which man divorced the other, who is dating so and so. You need someone who you can sit down on the word with and start discussing who is Jesus. Where is our generation going into what are we to teach our children how do we bring unity in the body of christ how do we pray for those that have fallen how do, do you see this how do you see that if you don't have that kind of friendship it dies so he says do not give up on the fellowship of the saints like some have and some have hit she break so they emphasize the place of fellowships, and that's where the ideas of what now you presently call cells began from. Little small groups of people meeting together to share experiences of what the Lord has done in their lives. I had a vision. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You understand? He says, I had a vision of this, and I had a vision of that, and what do you see? And then they start sharing, oh, brother, you're losing it here. Let's pray about it. You understand? Mm -hmm. And then they also emphasized one fundamental thing. 
they emphasized the place of spiritual discipline and accountability. Because today, we are not accountable. We are politically accountable. We are not really accountable. Oh, that's my spiritual father. That's my pastor. That's the man I look to. Do you really listen to him? Are you really accountable? Accountability firstly begins in our homes. Woo Praise God. For me as a pastor, he tells me if I cannot run my home, how can I run the household of Jesus Christ? God help me. The, it begins with us being accountable firstly to those that are with us. The Bible says submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. Everything I'm doing is in the accountability and betterment of the other man. If I feel that this will stumble another, I have to work on myself to make sure that I don't destroy what the Lord has built through me. And that doesn't mean that we don't have weaknesses or that we've not slipped and fallen, but our hearts have not fallen with our flesh. Our spirits still understand what truth is and repentance, godly sorrow, hits our hearts to say, you know what, God, I'm doing this, but it's not right. But when you're in a generation where the consciences are seared and men don't care anymore what they do to each other, whether I mess you up, whether I destroy you, whether I speak about you, whether you understand, we're not accountable to anybody. We're not accountable. And pastors, if you're pastors, some of you are going to become ministers. You tell me one ministry that is not fully accountable and it has been a success, they always hit shipwreck. History will tell you they always hit shipwreck. Hebrews 13, 17, no man watches over himself doesn't matter how deep word you have doesn't matter how much holy spirit you have it doesn't matter how much anointing you have there are things that will skip you but another brother will see we are each other's, other's keeper yes we cannot continue being what independent and then i see many of these like <laughs> some pastors oh me i'm not going to listen to anyone they're not accountable to anyone and then we find ourselves we find ourselves doing some of the stupidest things you could ever see why because nobody can talk to us so they bring accountability the moravians get up gave us the hymns and then they begat what you call modern missions it's through that that a young john wesley is on a sheep and lost he doesn't know what to do, where to go, and sort of encounters a fellow who's probably nine years younger, Peter Bola, and then he, they start talking. Wesley has questions. He's legal. He's full of strange doctrine and is disturbed. He's failed to find peace and salvation, the understanding of how a man lives the life of of faith how am i kept how am i uh, sanctified how am i uh, preserved in the gospel how do i stand how do i serve and everything and then he comes in contact with a fellow called peter bola which was moravian and then they start discussing the faith that is the guy that introduces john wesley to the lutheran teaching the calvinistic the present truth the gospel the grace and wesley runs mad Praise God. In fact, a time comes one time when he sent, this was after frustration of being set out in the field, two, three years as a missionary, and he comes back and he has no results. He's disturbed. That's why Peter Bola asks him the ultimate question. He asks him, John Wesley, are you really saved? Yes, I'm saved. John Wesley, he asks again, are you really, really saved? The only difference between John Wesley and many Christians is John Wesley thought it through. Many Christians, if I ask you, are you born again? Many people say, yeah, of course. Yeah. How, how, why not? How come? You understand? But John Wesley took time to think it through. And when he thought it through, he communed with his soul and discovered that indeed this was a man who understood salvation, but he wasn't really as born again as he should understand it. That's when he tells God the famous words, give me that thing, that when I have it, I shall know that I have it. That's when the real experience comes on that man. And as we see later on, the Wesleyans are responsible for the present day charismatic movement and the holiness movement that begets the Pentecostal movement in 1901, Charles Palm, Topeka, Kansas. That same flame sort of again goes through our church missionary people the recipients uh, also of azusa our edward joe 
church, which brings the East African Revival Movement. The Wesleyan thing is bigger than you think. It's bigger than you think. But it begins with these fellows called the Moravians. And hence that is a period we had the Moravian what? Revivals. They are known in history for having written some of the biggest number of hymns. Praise God. And so as that comes through, and, you know, pietism is born through, the numbers and hunger of the spirit goes on and on and on. And then in the early 1700s is when also we start to see what we call the Great Awakening. What you call the first Great Awakening. What is revival? Psalms 85 verses 6. Revive us that we might what? Psalms 85 verse 6. Revive us that we might what? Seek you. Yes. That we might rejoice in the joy of salvation. That the joy of the glory of Christ will be eminent in everyone. That it is not forced by men who call it faith. Yet it's not faith and they are not genuinely happy. And who try to live on the, on the bio of if I continue confessing it, I'll have it. And they confess it and they never have it. Because they are not speaking from the affirmation of the spirit. They are copying the lines of everyone is speaking. Because the generation has learned to speak right. Praise God. And so we see the birth of John Wesley. Which was, of course... An England born of Arminian doctrine. It's important for you to understand that. But he had a fellow with him who was a George Whitfield, right? George Whitfield was Calvinist. You will come to that a bit later. So John Wesley, this fellow, this English fellow from England, he encounters the Spirit of God. Then he starts going on the back of his horse. Historians tell you that horse got so used that he did not need to direct it with the hands anymore. He just used to tap his feet and the horse knew where they were being told because he needed enough time to read while he was going for journey. They say every day he traveled for more than 45 miles on horseback. And they say in his entire history of ministry, he traveled more than 250,000 miles on the horseback. That is like going around the world 10 times. He preached more than 40 thousand sermons. He wrote over 6,500 hymns. That guy John Wesley. The souls that have been one since John Wesley, we cannot compare. In his time there were more than 200,000 physical conversions that later beget uh, the bigger deal. And then he has a brother called Charles Wesley. They work together. George Whitfield, the guy I told you about, was originally an actor, Shakespearean. All right? Like what Billy Sandy would have been. If you saw the revivalist called Billy Sandy, he should have been an actor if he wasn't preaching. But it's through these men that we see the first great awakening. Right? Why is it called a great awakening? Europe responded to the gospel like never before, but with a pietistic understanding everywhere salvation came was seeking for three things personal experience with the lord jesus christ accountability and true fellowship that is what was and then we see hundreds of people one movements begotten through that the dutch reformed church gets it through by a guy called william tennant the presbyterian he takes it on jonathan edwards the congregationalist in new england connecticut he gets the fire southern baptists get it through a guy called samuel davis the line starts to move and the anointing starts to flow in that movement like never before but why was it the great awakening those three things emphasize Praise God. So then it allows missions to Native America. It brings the building of universities like Preston, Rutgers, uh, Dartmouth, all of those guys, those universities, great universities, come through that. And then we see the place where uh, hundreds of churches are formed because of the converts. And that is the first time we start to see church and state separating. Why? Because people were able to sustain and run their own ministries. The giving of the saints through the right way to give. They realized that the, as the things were not, the finances were not being diverted, they came back to the church and then they helped the poor. And then consequently we start to see churches being sustained and then government starts to free itself from the responsibility of churches because churches could run themselves. 
praise God, which was a good thing because every time church and state are separated, the freedom and liberty of the spirit is ensued. They don't lead you to tell you what to do and to do it, who is right and who isn't right. There is no government that can design spiritual things. This, that's why I tell people that even though there is madness in our nation and the world across, the answer is not to bring and regulate. No. The Bible says that a man sowed his what? Seed and wheat comes through. And what does the Bible say? Tears were sown among the wheat. The Bible tells you let the wheat grow with the tears. Let it grow. Let it grow. Don't touch it to say let's regulate and cut off because in the process you'll damage the wheat. You, you kill innocent people. No. What do you do? You let it grow. And at a particular point, it will be gunned by who? By the boss, which is God. And he will get the tears and burn them. God himself will get the tears and what? Burn them. And the wheat will be preserved. The church is not to be regulated. Let's leave them to grow. They will be placed. Praise God. And it's through that first great awakening that we see the growth of sanity in the church because men were reading their word and their experiences were genuine from the word. Praise God. And from then on in the 1740s, uh, it ensues from 1720s into the 1740s, 40 years later, God earns another blessedness and the power comes through. And the second great awakening is what? Is born. Praise God. And it's through these Christian universities like Princeton, Yale, and then these guys are having more of the experience. There's a hunger of the things of God because they are seeing what God is doing. And I've seen when the church keeps a certain steady line of the word and the spirit, God just continues adding more oil. You start to see what you call in scripture from glory to glory. That's First Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening was a true picture of what it means for a church to start walking in the steadiness of the spirit. You start to see God adding onto the children a more dispens deeper dispensation. Every 40 or 50 years, you start to see God sending something fresh and deeper. And no doubt, the Second Great Awakening was deeper and had deeper results and conversions than the First Great Awakening. But the First Great Awakening was more Calvinistic even though the leader was Armenian, the second Great Awakening was more Armenian. Uh, <laughs> you will understand that later because it's in the second Great Awakening that we start to see uh, these divisions starting to come through and clearly men separating Armenian from uh, Calvin. Praise God. So in the second Great Awakening, of course, we start to see um, in the East, there was a fellow called Timothy Dwight. Because again, I also need to show you the real war in America. You see, most of the parts in the earlier church, we were around Rome. Right? And then almost as we saw, we start to see ourselves around England. Now you see we are moving more to America. So you see how the spirit is moving. Eh? That's why it's evident that Africa. <laughs> Woo! Praise God. Hallelujah. Something is coming. Prepare yourselves. America, like I told you, in that time is split between two blocks, right? The Baptist and Methodist of the West, the Presbyterian and Congregationalist of the East. The Congregationalists and the Presbyterian of the East embrace more of a Calvinistic doctrine. The Baptist and Methodists of the West embrace more of an Armenian understanding. And so you start to see that in the East, there was deism, right? God created the world and distanced himself for human, from humanity. He has no business with men. They're the ones to deal with themselves. There was more of rationalism in that side of the world. So if revival was to come, many of the guys who were to come in that time, they were to attack that, right? Like if you come to the West, West was richer. West was was more prosperous but then you also start to see a lot of greed and love for money so if revival is to hit the west those that are teaching in the west are attacking the greed of the day so you see they have to be different because of the challenges they are not similar so in the east you see men like timothy dwight 
right, which was a grandson of Whitfield of the first great awakening. And then you see him fighting the days of the reasoning and rationalism of the day. There was an American fellow called Thomas Paine. He was the Voltaire of America. This guy hit Thomas Paine so badly. Thomas Paine also abused, he was abusive and aggressive, exactly like Voltaire. And his end also was also exactly like Voltaire. Thomas Paine died a broke guy. He was a drunkard and he, he died with nothing in his name. That was a lesson to those that were watching. For any man that sets himself against the gospel and the Bible, attack Apostle Grace, but don't touch revelation. Don't touch the word and their message. No, attack the person. But don't attack what comes out of my mouth. Because if it is of God, the end is always clear. Praise God. So in the West, we see the guys who are attacking the greedy groups and guys who have given themselves to money and not God. You see the group of the James Magrady, which is Calvinist in nature. He's a Princetonian and Presbyterian guy. You see Daniel Boone. You see Barton Stone. Yeah, and then later on we start to see deeper names, some of the most prolific names in the Second Great Awakening, like Henry Ward and Henry Ward Beecher and Grandison Finney, Charles Grandison Finney, that Presbyterian minister. And you start to see the move of the spirit becoming very distinctive. Right? But in that time also, America is split. Right? The West is Armenian. The East is, no, yes, the, the West is a minion, the East is Calvinistic, right? The West, which is a minion, is very, they call it, is enthusiastic, the emotional people, right? The side of the Calvinists, they are emotional guys. That's why now you start to see the split of do you need to fall? Do you need to scream? Do you need to cry under the anointing? Those things, are they in scripture? Is it allowed? So if I scream, does that mean I don't have the Holy Spirit? If I don't scream, does that mean you have more spirit, you who scream than I who scream? So if a guy falls down, does that mean he's full of the Holy Spirit and me who stays up, I don't have the Holy Spirit? Does that mean that because the guy is up and then he has the Holy Spirit and then he's not shaking and the guy is shaking, the guy in the corner is shaking, that means the guy who's shaking is right than the guy who is not shaking? Does that mean that if you are speaking in tongues and then screaming and saying, rah, 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 and me, I'm not, does that means you're more spiritual or does that mean you're more spiritual? I think you're becoming strange. That's emotional. That's not right. That is Jacobus Arminius. You understand? But it begins in the central doctrine. Calvin says man has no free will. It's God's sovereignty. Right? Jacob as a minion has, says no, man has free will and he can choose. But Calvin says no, they cannot come to him except if he draws them. Jacob as a minion is saying yes, even if he draws them, they have choice and there's something powerful there that means they have the choice to choose whether it's heaven or it's hell no god says no they are predestined he knows who is elected for hell and who is elected for heaven and then jacob Arminia says but he would not say that he wills that all men be saved and they come to the knowledge the debate now is no longer grace doctrine no it is what is the election what is the atonement has god has a limited to have a limited atonement uh is there a special group of the elect that those ones if you are among the elect you are predestined for salvation and there's a guy who is rebellious on his own because he was not elected no 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 but he wills all men that be saved and they come to the knowledge of him yes he wills but does that mean that everyone will get saved no does god know who will rebel in the end so he doesn't waste time on him or if he does so then why are we evangelizing and going on missions <laughs> why are you wasting time on a guy who god has already predestined he says for these were foreordained for for that for the subverting of souls but what's the end of the subversion of souls do we see repentance of them or does that mean that they are forever going to be unrepentant what about the son of perdition in whom will the spirit speak to the fulfillment of prophecy do i need to preach the gospel to that guy or don't i need to preach the gospel to that guy but he told us go ye in the world preach the gospel to everybody and whosoever believes shall be baptized what about those who don't believe they shall be damned so that means god you there are some people you have ordained to die no he said his blood the scripture says he's the propitiation for all our sins not only us but for the whole world so that means it dies for some sins but certain people are not going to receive him because they are not elect according to his foreknowledge that's the debate really that's the debate really free will versus God's sovereignty. 
did I get born again at the time when God ordained it that I should get born again or did I get born again because I finally agreed to receive salvation because that affects how you evangelize that affects how you preach that affects how you teach that affects how you minister that affects when the spirit comes do I have the right to respond to him? Does he do anything, whatever he wants with me, or do I have control? Now, all of those things become very interesting things. So you see certain people saying, you know what? For us, we don't believe in the screaming, the falling, the tongues, the everything. That's for, right? That the Calvinists are opposed to those things. In fact, very deep-seated Calvinists, some of them don't even speak in tongues. And they don't care to speak in tongues. They don't even care to know whether they'll speak in tongues or not. And there's a very, very, very notable evangelist. You go read in history. One of the most notable evangelists of the 20th century. That fellow never spoke in tongues. When you go deeper into him, some of them are Calvin. Some of them are. But not all Calvin are opposed to the demonstration of the Spirit. Some are in for it. And then there are also us who agree a bit with Jacobus and agree also a bit with Calvin because the way the oil came, we don't know how the anointing came, but it came and I just found myself speaking in tongues and I laid hands on a sister. I didn't want her to fall. I just found her on the floor. Even the day I was filled by the Holy Spirit, I didn't plan it. I didn't know Calvin. I didn't understand Jacobus Seminius. I didn't celebrate. I, didn't, I couldn't separate the law and the grace. I was just there hungry for God. And the next thing I you know, I find myself on the floor and my mouth is speaking words. I don't know what they are. I'm saying, Braka, Baba, Shaka, Taba, Ra. I, I don't have control over my mouth. And the guy will say, you're unstable. Because of what he was taught in his Bible school. But in Africa, I didn't even have opportunity to know that. Master, we found a man casting out devils in your name and we forbid him for he does not follow with us. He does not behold the doctrine of the Calvinists. He's shaking and screaming like the present truth Pentecostals. In Africa, we did not have that. That's why when we get into the East African revival, that thing was so pure and, it, and very, very undefiled. It did not have a doctrine to it. It only stressed the person of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, and the experience of the Holy Spirit. That is why many Western churches are losing the power. They are talking more and they're losing the power. When you get a lame man, they have excuse. When you get a deaf ear, they have excuse. But bring an African man a deaf ear. Bring me a blind eye. Bring me a dead person. Because you cannot run away from the reality of the anointing. That's why you see, even some of you have been to our crusades, you've seen tumors disappear, the deaf hearing, the lame walking, and many of them are starting to lose the oil slowly because they're becoming more liberal in the understanding of grace, the message. And they are getting so right in the word, but they experience is dying. The experience is dying. Praise